welcome to another discussion of the Quranic studies. In this session, we would, we would like to <clears throat> discuss a little bit about the uh, basis of uh, the Islamic law and the, the, the <clears throat> sources of it and um, a little bit of the history of the Islamic law and some terminology related to Islamic law. So basically when we talk about law in any religion, in fact, we are trying to, I mean, not we, but the religion itself tries to uh, reflect and represent the will of God. I mean, we usually as human beings, we do things, we do, you know, um, basically have kind of social individual interaction with each other. Uh, we connect to each other in different ways, uh, whether it is like a family relation or whether it's a business relation or whether it is a social and political relationships, you know. People of a country have a certain relationship with the government and um, kids with their parents and couples with each other. And uh, what uh, <coughs> uh, establishes or what uh, uh, gives a kind of order and what the rules over this kind of relationship is what is called law. Now, the point is that uh, in a religion like Islam, when we talk about the uh, law, and then we exactly try to uh, <coughs> understand uh, what the purpose of God or the divine is when it talks about different kinds of relationships. Now, not only between the people to people and people to objects, but people to God as well. Uh, basically, uh, <clears throat> in every Abrahamic religion or any other religion, it, uh, whether it is Zoroastrianism, which is an, an uh, old Iranian and Persian religion, and then Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, I mean, we always, you know, encountered the, the notion of law, as well as notion of morals. But, <clears throat> uh, so, the law in religion, if you look at the uh, Zoroastrianism, basically religion is a something that purifies the world, uh, makes it clean. And uh, so this is the, the concept of religion, something to purify, because basically in, in uh, uh, Zoroastrianism, the idea of uh, light and darkness are in front of each other. And then the religion is uh, the message of God or the path of God in which you uh, try to, you know, help and purify the world and push back the darkness. So it's kind of helping the light and fighting the darkness. Now in Judaism, uh, there's one uh, very uh, important concept in Judaism is that uh, basically and historically, one of the elements in the uh, Judaism is that you do have a lot of laws in this uh, religion. I talked a little bit about Moses in the Quran and uh, in some, some of the interpretations of, Quran, of the Quran, we noticed that uh, Muslim interpreters uh, mentioned that God revealed or 
it revealed a lot of laws, uh, ordered a lot of laws to Jewish people because uh, later he wanted to punish pe Jews, Jewish people uh, for the scene that they have, they did during the uh, time uh, after Moses and uh, the time that they started to worship the, the cow. Now, basically, it is uh, quite well known that uh, Midrash, for instance, the books, uh, or, you know, there is a good source of law in Judaism. Now, when you go to back to Christianity, Jesus, however, he follows some of the basic main rules and laws of Judaism, but he as well tries to reject some of them, rejecting in a form of kind of reforming and freeing people from those laws. So more spirituality and uh, it comes through Jesus and fights back those uh, laws. So in Christianity, people intent is more important than replacement is the replacement of the law as it is uh, discussed by <clears throat> Christians. Now, when we talk about Islam, basically Muslims, uh, uh, and the, the history of Islam, or uh, Islamic scholars, they uh, put Islam in somewhere in between Judaism and Christianity. So if there, there is one is full pack of law and the other one is full pack of uh, spirituality, Islam tries to define itself as self as something in between these two. Uh, world religion. <clears throat> now, when we discuss about the law in Islam, there are some key terms we need to pay attention to those. One of them is the Sharia, which is very well uh, repeatedly heard, and especially from the news. And uh, it's a, basically it's a divine law as it exists in the mind of God. So also Sharia, as a board means that a path, and it's kind of a path toward God. And um, um, so when this word of shara or shara or sharia, uh, sharia is uh, in another way, is it, uh, uh, when a river, like a, a notion like a river, which the, the water goes into that river and finds its way, its path, and then uh, the <coughs> Sharia here is also as well, a kind of a path, <clears throat> but as well as a, it's the divine law, it exists in the mind of God. Now, the other concept in Islam is the idea, uh, the notion of fiqh. Fiqh <clears throat> is the law as deduced by religious scholars, the dis 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 discipline of Islamic law. So, as a science, fiqh is a science, jurisprudence in another way, which, you know, uh, those um, ideas in the divine, which was, uh, which were uh, basically mentioned in the Quran and in Islamic sources as a general notion, as a general ideas, and, and inside the fact they become like a law, they become like, <clears throat> And the discipline of the Islamic law. <clears throat> now you try to, you do have something in, in the Quran and you try to make it a, a law. For instance, Quran talks about uh, there is, for instance, 
try to, you know, uh, forgive someone who made this and that, or try to divide the uh, uh, divide the money of the one who has passed away uh, among his children in a certain way. And then the knowledge of fiqh is discussed in more detail about how to do those things. Now, to understand the, 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 the text of Quran, you do also have another science which is called usul al-fiqh, which is basically introduces the rules by which Islamic law is deduced. So, you do have a sentence again in the Quran, and then fiqh wants to make it a law, but the Surah fiqh tells, tells you how to use that word, how to use that sentence in, in order to make it as a law. <clears throat> again, in Islamic sense, the, the, you do have the Sunnah, which is the practice of Islamic community, but more specifically, uh, this is the practice of uh, the Islamic prophet or prophet Muhammad and uh, so it's a tradition in a religious sense uh, in which you see uh, the discussion here is that the sunnah of prophet or the tradition of prophet Muhammad how he was doing such and su how he was doing things in such and such conditions how he was praying how he was you know dividing uh, um, goods among people, how he was, you know, doing hajj, how he was performing different religious rituals. So it's a, it's his sunnah, how, how he was doing the things related to individuals, to himself and to others, and in business, and in community, and in government. So that's basically another point. And uh, one of the other uh, concepts is mazhab, uh, which is basically the, uh, and the school of Islamic law. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, again, it's kind of similar concept like Sharia. Mazhab is a pathway, is the path that you choose as a follower of a religion to understand the Islamic law in accordance to one very major scholar. And you have to, you, you, you follow him as your, you know, great master. Um, and then we will discuss a little bit more about the mazhab well, let me take the other key term, which is fatwa. It, this is also uh, repeatedly mm, used in news and medias. So fatwa is an individual Islamic scholar's le legal ruling or legal ideas. a thing or a notion or a legal idea that he, a person, an individual who is authorized, when he issues an idea about doing things in a certain way, he's issuing his own fatwa. And basically there are many different kinds of fatwas because there are many different kind of people with different kind of mentality and with different kind of viewpoint. And interpretation exists and differences exist and different fatwas and different notions are there. So when we speak about the Islamic law, we do know that it includes different kind of things. Um, basically, um, we can talk about rituals, 
rituals are uh, um, kind of from basic to advanced and doing things like purity, for instance, uh, very important, uh, a very important act and practice in any religion, including Islam, is a worshiping, worshiping God and prayers. Now to do those prayers, one needs to be pure or purify himself. So Islam and the Muslim prays based on a five time a day and those prayer, prayers needs another thing which is kind of purifying yourself in order to pray now which is another word called wudu so Islamic law tells you that how to purify yourself one two how to pray the five time praying per day as a minimum prayer and so basically this law tells you how to do those those are not uh, those are a common per prayers that uh, are mostly read in congregation but individually as well but there are other kind of prayers as well but everyone can do at home or wherever he is another thing another ritual is fasting during the month of ramazan and also pilgrimage to mecca and performing hajj is an important uh, uh, islamic obligation for those who are able to do that and once a year people who are uh, financially able to travel to mecca to do this pilgrimage they do, do, do. so anyway uh, rituals one of the islamic laws aspects of islamic laws two is the contract as i mentioned we people live together in a society it's 11 o'clock whether as a father and children or couples or people to people people to institutions people to government we do have contracts we do have social contract, we do have inter, in, in, individual contract, how to do things, how to perform things, how to do marriage, and how to divorce, how to marry, how to divorce. So those contracts, it's in, in family law, in marriage, in divorce, in inheritance, and then again, and some other also criminal laws, like uh, what happens to if someone commits a murder adultery fornication theft apostasy again and uh, last uh, 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 the last one is uh, religious taxes how to pay those taxes how much one need to pay uh for what uh What's the basis? What's the goal of paying those roll taxes and uh, things like that? Oh, so uh, uh, in, in another way, what one may, may need to ask the question or to answer the question: What the Islamic law does not include it? Uh, it does not include the practical state law. It doesn't tell you that uh, what form of uh, government you need to have, or you know, basically, it doesn't talk about uh, you know a specific way of governing, or it doesn't talk about most criminal laws or local practices and customs. So when we talk about criminal law. Uh, 
we know that in in the Quran there are some basic mainly like uh, murder, uh, adultery, and things like that are mentioned. But uh, most of the criminal laws are not there, but in the top of in the books of fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence, they do speak about that. <clears throat> now, uh, one common idea among the Muslim when uh, we ask them, what are the uh, basis of Islamic law? Basically, as uh, we mentioned, Quran is the very source of Islamic law. But except that, a saying of prophet or hadith, there are many hadiths that they speak about the law or how to do things. And um, this is basically in uh, Sunni Islam uh, as the Hadith of Prophet or the saying of the Prophet of Islam. But at the same time, uh, in the Shia Islam, it also includes some narrations plus uh, after Prophet of Islam, some narrations of the Shia Imams, uh, those who, you know, uh, were uh, called as uh, the successors of Muhammad. Basically, they do, uh, they, their uh, duty is to uh, perform as um, someone who guide people and help people to understand the tradition of Muhammad in Shia Islam. But anyway, there's another, there's another basis of Islamic law, which is called Ijma or consensus. So which mom means that uh, uh, generally later generation, Muslim generation, they, when they had difficulties to understand or they, when they had this agreement in understanding or in performing some certain things, they were trying to go back, look at the books, look at the literatures, and understand that if majority of Muslim scholars uh, talked in a way, in a common way about one issue, a certain issue, a certain problem, when they found, when they were finding out that yes, a good number of like. 90% of Muslim scholars, at some point, 100% of Muslim scholars had the same ideas about some certain issues. Then they were saying that this issue is ijma'i, or there's a consensus about those issues. Uh, there's another one uh, called an analogy of bias and mostly used in Sunni fiqh or Sunni jurisprudence. Um, and the meaning of qiyas or analogy is that in certain situation, you do know the, the, the ruling of Islam or Islamic law, and then you compare it with the other situation, and then you give the same you know, rule or law for the situation. But uh, there are different kinds of uh, analogy in Islamic fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence. Not all kinds of analogies are, are accepted, some of them are not. And analogy, especially in the Shia fiqh, is not, is not very welcomed <coughs> for, for different reasons. <coughs> and uh, yeah. So that's kind of uh, not very, I mean, it's called uh, Qiyas, but it is mostly accepted among the Sunnis, not among the Shias. Uh, there's another thing which is called personal opinion, uh, as well, mostly in the Sunni Islam, uh, called uh, Istihsan. Um, 
based on their own ideas, they do things. Uh, instead of a personal opinion and the Sunni Islam and this uh, another thing as uh, the force uh, sources of the basis of Islamic Islam, the Shia Islam, called al or intellect or reason. So kind of reasoning uh, individual endeavor to understand one uh, rule from the sources and based on the you know, mental, intellectual, uh, uh, rational, uh, you know, endowing and understanding things. <clears throat> now, we all, all already mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, the Quran is the basis of the main basis of Islamic law. Uh, But the point is that if, if someone asks us whether Quran itself is a book of law or no, the, 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 the very simple answer is that no, Quran is not a book of law. Yes, there are laws in the Quran, but let's talk about the percentage. What's the percentage of the verses? Which, which are discussing about the law in the Quran in comparison with the verses that are speaking about theology, that are speaking about, you know, hereafter, that are speaking about God, that are speaking about, you know, good and bad, morals, ethics, and, you know, things like that. I mean, <clears throat> from about 6,000 verses, there are about 500 verses of Quran discussing about the law. But nevertheless, it's not a systematic chapter and it's not a system, systematic exposition. It's unsystematic. You do have it here and there. And then it's your, uh, the scholars, it's a scholar's duty to understand, to relate things together and then to bring <clears throat> uh, the outcome as a Islamic law. Uh, Quran talks about law, but I mentioned the greater body of Islamic law is in the Hadith literature, in the Syria literature. <clears throat> now, um, we do know that Prophet of Islam uh, lived about 10 years in Mecca, 13 years in Medina. Uh, the number of, the number of laws uh, revealed to Muhammad in Mecca in comparison to those who revealed, that revealed in Medina, they're much less than the total. The verses in Medina. Why? The reason is that because during Mecca, Muhammad is dealing with polytheists, talking about the unity of God, defining religion as a pass back to God. But uh, yes, God needs to tell people how to pray at the same time. But when Muhammad goes to Medina. Muslim community for living together, for making a community needs law. People have contract with each other, with others, with non-Muslims. People want to marry, what they should do, how they are performing this. People probably need to go to Hajj to pilgrimage, but they do. Now, <clears throat> basically, we know that there were rules and laws in the Arabia before Islam 
some of them are rejected by Islam, but some of them are kind of accepted, but at the same time, there is a reformation of those local law. Marriage has been there always. Hajj or pilgrimage has been there. Islam gives a new form of it, corrects some of them based on its own principles. And for marriage, it puts the rules. There were a slavery before Islam. Islam gives rules. There were marriage, and there were polygamies. Islam gives rules. Quran gives rules on that. Do not exceed the four women, for instance. If you want to have more than one wife, there's a criteria. You must be able to perform justice among all of them. If you can do this, you can marry. So basically, um, those um, rules um, they existed. Islam gives a form and reform it, reforms them, and then signs them as a doesn't in, in some 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 cases it doesn't establish a law it signs a law with reforming it reshaping it and give it another uh, meaning also in discussion about the Islamic law I mentioned that one of the aspects of Islamic law was rituals. And also I mentioned that uh, Islam um, sometimes doesn't need to establish, doesn't establish laws, but it follows previous laws with some reformation. Now, one of the things that as, as also I mentioned that Judaism is a, is a religion of law, I mean, Islam. And it happened to say that there were uh, kind of some common things between Islam and, Christian, in, and Judaism at the beginning that after a while, those were, you know, uh, changed. Now, what, what are those things? I mean, th those changes were during the time of Muhammad. So one of the one of them is that uh, <clears throat> early Islamic practices evidently closely related to Jew Jewish. Uh, one of them, the prayer, you know, this, the, the the direction of their prayer, the Muslim prayer, is uh, toward Oshali. Uh, the uh, mosque and the uh, Shalim, the place, uh, also the place that uh, Jewish people they uh, direct and uh, in performing prayers. Now the po point is that um, uh, in in one day that Muhammad is praying. Uh, performing the prayer, uh, there's a revelation comes to him and ask him to turn his face from uh, uh, Palestine toward Mecca. Uh, now, uh, the verse is chapter two, verse 144, 145, 144, 45, it says that, Quran says that, uh, we see the turning your face to the heavens, we see the turning your face to the heavens. Now shall we turn you to a Qibla, 
that shall please you. So the point is that Muhammad was uh, praying toward uh, the uh, Jews, uh, Jews uh, direction. And at the same time, probably there has been some criticism uh, from uh, Jews saying that he is, you know, basically praying to war out, Qibla. And Muhammad probably was not happy with this. And uh, Quran says that God mentions that he, he saw Muhammad was not happy with this following the Qibla of Jews. And then God says that I, we understood your upsetness and then now it says that the order of God comes like this, turn then your face in the direction of the sacred mosque. Wherever you are, turn your faces in that direction. The people of the book know well that the tears, the, tr the truth from their Lord, nor is God unmindful of what they do and then even if you, you were to bring the people of the book all the sign they would not follow you they would they would not follow your qibla nor are you going to follow their qibla now the point is that uh, god tells muhammad even if you bring whatever miracle they ask you to perform finally they are not going to to believe you so turn your face away from the qibla and then god introduced the another qibla to muhammad which is mecca in arabia and now as a, the most sacred place the muslim they do pray toward it uh, before going to the major aspect of Islamic law and the Quran, uh, I would like to also emphasize on another issue um, uh, regarding the uh, Islamic law. Um, <clears throat> and that's the point that Quran itself introduced Muhammad as one who whose action, whose practice, whose behavior is bringing the law to people and to the Muslim or followers. And then uh, in, 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 in the Quran, <clears throat> verse 157, in the Surah Shura, or, you know, or in the verse, uh, in the chapter seven, verse 157 uh, the Quran talks about Muhammad as a messenger of God the people that believe um, and it said that uh, this prophet uh, brings what is right and forbids what is wrong and makes good things lawful for them and forbids them bad things and relieve them of their burden and the shackles that were upon them. Now, the point is that also um, there's a, an idea that uh, uh, the Jews, they were having a uh, certain amount of, uh, a good amount of prayers and orders and rules. And uh, the idea is that Muhammad was trying to release them or relieve them from those many laws but uh, with the, if they accept they accept and they come and uh, being free of those burdens of not not uh, does those who believe in him honor him help him and follow the right that he has been sent down with him and it is you who shall uh, now, <clears throat> I'm going back to Islamic law. 
uh, the major aspects of Islamic law. Uh, those in individuals and uh, in social community level, uh, basically we mentioned uh, the five pillars to Islam. One is uh, uh, the prayer, which is called also a salad. And the other one is fasting of the month of Ramadan. <clears throat> and the other one is the uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, alms, uh, uh, which is also called the zakat, and uh, testimony of faith or shahada. Uh, testimony of faith is to, uh, you know, to say, uh, la ilaha illallah, there's no God but God, or there's no Allah but Allah. Uh, and then to say that, and Muhammad is his messenger. Uh, you know, uh, so all these things are, are five uh, pillars of, uh, you know, Islamic law, Islamic religion, uh, which are in the Quran as well. Now, uh, um for 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 Shia Islam, this is these are generally for Sunni Islam, but the, for Shia Islam there is something also uh uh there which is uh, uh Valaya or the leadership of the successors of Muhammad and from his family from his household. Now, uh, one of the main points is that when the Quran puts the law and talks about law, when, in one aspect, in, uh, in, the, in the chapter 42 uh, on the Shawar, and it explains that the law that God gives to Muhammad is the law that God has been given to previous prophets as well. And in that way, it's a continuation of the God or divine law that uh, revealed upon any other prophets. Now, again, there's something else related to this law or the divine law. And that's the idea of uh, rewards and punishments. So. In another way, if a follower follows those laws, he will be rewarded. Or if he doesn't follow the law, he will be punished. Now, a matter is that where someone will be punished or rewarded. Basically, um, you know, putting, uh, putting the law into practice in an in, 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 in individual level uh, and in social level is a big question. Who has the authority to put the law in order in a society? Who has the authority to, for instance, punish people for the unlawful things that they are doing in this world. So it is clear and understandable that the day of judgment is the day that God rewards or punishes people based on their deeds. Now the question is that whether in this world, I mean, someone else than prophet can be a center of uh, an authority to, uh, you know, to punish people based on what they didn't do or based on how they did things unlawfully. For instance, if, uh, you know, there are different kind of rules and laws we, we talked about. We said that Islamic law is covering different parts, one, one is prayers. Now the question is, if someone doesn't pray, 
daily basis, is is he going to be punished in uh, in this world, or it's upon God to punish or forgive him? Um, in a restrict sense, in a very restrict sense, in a very restrict understanding and a very narrow understanding way of Islamic law. Someone may uh, claim that it's upon a governor of a community, a ruler, to punish those kind of people. But generally speaking, uh, the, the understanding among the Muslim has been as such that there, there are um, practices, prayers, or duties between an individual and his, uh, his or her of God, and then the only one who can punish and reward a person, an individual, based on those things is God again. So no, no one else can punish. So this is this is part of law between man and God. But what and then there are other parts about man and himself, his body, his soul. Imagine if someone uh, harmed himself in different ways, and then that also is something between he and his God, or she and he, he and him. He is an inherent and body and God. Now, there's another question. What if someone, you know, um, someone harm other people? Someone kills other people unlawfully? And, uh, uh, you know, those kind of problems. Who has the authority to, you know, um, practice the law and punish the, you know, murderer. Now, basically in the Islamic history and what Muslim they tried to do, especially, uh, I'm talking about after this of Muhammad, is that the rulers or caliphs, uh, they tried to establish uh, a system which was, you know, in the beginning, very basic. Uh, sometimes, you know, people were coming to them and saying that I did such and such, or the other person did such and such, and then they were going to investigate, and then they were going to issue a help, issue a judgment, and, you know, a certain punishment or jail. Uh, but later on, if all caliphs were kind of accepted a standard authority among Muslims. What if someone was claiming he is, uh, you know, the successor of Muhammad, but majority or a good amount of people were not accepting him as an authority. Now there was a question and there was a problem and uh, so we had always kind of discussions whether this guy is legitimate or not. But basically, uh, among the people and among the scholars, the authority has been given to the scholars of uh, the scholars, uh, Islamic scholars of fiqh which I uh, explained that fiqh was part of the Islamic sciences, which was um, um, focusing on understanding Islamic laws. So if someone was uh, sort of an uh, expert of Islamic fiqh, then he was able to sort of judge among people based on his knowledge of fiqh. I said, basically, understanding Islamic law needs a prior knowledge, a prior different kind of uh, uh, you know, mastery and skillfulness in different sciences as well. 
Uh, it is not very simple to open a book and say that, oh, you did this, so this is the judgment and this is the punishment. So uh, basically, anyway, uh, the Islamic uh, you know, literature on law gradually kind of uh, developed. And uh, so also different schools of understanding Islamic law appeared within the eighth and ninth century. So uh, when we talked a little bit about mazhabs, especially in the Sunni Islam, we do have four different, at least four different schools and four different standard schools of, uh, you know, fiqh and understanding Islamic law and Islamic even kind of uh, principles among the uh, Sunnis, uh, Sun, Sun, Sunni Muslims, those schools are called Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, and Hanbali. So the, basically these are um, you know, kind of grand uh, faqihs or grand uh, uh, Jewists uh, who they also, you know, um, wrote their teaching and spread their teaching in uh, based on their own approach and based on their own manners. And then uh, so the people that are following each of those. Usually, I mean, uh, when we to, to, when we look at them, we see that uh, this region for instance, in Africa, are following the Maliki fiqh. So the other region are following another fiqh. These are uh, among the people. So among the people, it becomes a matter of uh, uh, probably who the tribe or people or cities uh, uh, follow and then they do follow the same guy. But among the scholars, it's based on their viewpoint. They understand the differences and they choose the mazhab, what they want. Now, uh, in the Shia Islam, uh, basically the, 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 the standard understanding of Islamic law is based on the interpretations that Shia Imams provide for people. Um, basically, um, you know, the six, seven, and sometimes eight Imam are those who uh, provided the main and you know uh, majority of Islamic law. They were kind of interpreters, they were kind of explaining the rules, and uh, they were those who, in fact, established the Shi school of uh, Jewish problems, and uh, uh, mainly uh, Muhammad al-Baqir and Ja'far al-Sadiq, uh, the fifth and sixth Imam among the Shiites, they did, you know, um, uh, had the opportunity to uh, establish uh, Islamic fiqh or Islamic Jewish programs, uh, you know, uh, for uh, a school that you know was called uh, the Shia school mm -hmm. of Islam. So now this Shia school of Islam later on, uh, you know, uh, generation after generation, there was an idea that okay, what the Imam said, but how we do that into practice in 9th century, 10th century, when the imam, there isn't, and there isn't the imam. But the idea among the Shia was uh, something as college called Ijtihad. You know, it was a personal endeavor to understand the law, to understand the, you know, the time, and to understand uh, basically how to interpret that certain law for that a certain condition and things like that. So nowadays, if you hear the word Ayatollahs, it refers to those, basically refers to those people who were 
you know, expert of Islamic law in the Shia Islam. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the formation of the law basically uh, developed in the 8th and 9th centuries. <clears throat> and when Islamic schools, you know, uh, uh, kind of developed and divided, the very, one of the basic and major elements and difference between them was this uh, juristic elements and difference among them. Basically, all of them, they were, you know, accepting uh, God as one God, Muhammad as prophet of that God, Quran as their book. But when it was coming to the laws and how to do this and or how to do that, if this, this thing is uh, prohibited or allowed it, so they had differences, different ideas because of the different uh, narrations that they had, because of the different interpretation that they had. So those are the basic uh, a major thing in divisions, in appearance of different schools. One, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, about the Shia Islam, as I said, that you heard the word Ayatollahs, and then it says it uh, refers to those experts of Islamic law in Shia Islam. Again, in the uh, Sunni Islam, uh, the word is used for this group of people is Muftis. Muftis are mostly uh, experts of Islamic law in the Sunni Islam. And sometimes it happened that um, an Ayatollah or Mufti, as well, he is, in fact, an expert of Islamic philosophy, expert of Sufism, and things like that. So uh, we put the uh, Islamic Jewish brothers or Islamic fiqh among the uh, Islamic uh, transitional or transmitted knowledge and uh, we put Islamic philosophy in Islamic, uh, in the category of Islamic intellectual knowledge. Now, uh, for, uh, for those people who are, um, or who were experts of Islamic law, they were in fact a master of Islamic transmitted knowledge. Uh, but those who were, you know, experts of Islamic, Theology, philosophy, we put them in the category of the experts of Islamic intellectual knowledge. And there are two differences among them, but majority of the clergy is they were, uh, you know, masters of law. I mean, they, they knew law rather than knowing mostly, you know, philosophy and intellectual traditions. And then uh, that's why basically the main subject that studies in Islamic seminaries or as what is called as madrasas was again, the Islamic law, how to do this, how to, not to do that, how to understand the rules, how to understand how to divide the inherit, inheritance of a, uh, you know, <coughs> this uh, dead person to his uh, uh, remaining family, wife and children, how to do this, how to do that. So Magnus is usually providing people to uh, help other community people to understand how to practice their religion. Now, the, yes, there were subject uh, subjects like philosophy and mysticism in the Magnus, but the majority or main subject of Magnus were was to, to teach people uh, understanding uh, Islamic law. <clears throat> so I mentioned uh, earlier and in my discussion that uh, we do have four different uh, Sunni mashabs and uh, Hanafi, uh, I mentioned, was one of them. The uh, founder of the Hanafi mashab was Abu Hanifa, who was originated in Iraq and uh, known as generally most liberal and rationalist among the others. Uh, and Ottoman Empire in Turkey mostly followed him, um, Imam Abu Hanifa. 
So they, we call them Hanafi. Uh, the second one is the Shafi. So which was strong in Egypt mostly. As I mentioned, there, I mean, you see that Islamic faith and schools of faith are kind of regional. So, <clears throat> and practically it's, uh, it's uh, useful because uh, when you do have all people based on the Hanafi mazhab, then you do have the, you know, if there is a issue in court for, I mean, historically, because courts were, I, I mentioned that based on Islamic law. And then, uh, so when all of them are based on uh, Hanafi mazhab, then the, the, the judge was, you know, it was easy for, for the judge to uh, be Hanafi and then to uh, judge among it. But there were, you know, we, we do have the, uh, the historical uh, account of the judge who were master of four different school and then they were able to judge among those two parties based on the schools that they are following. Anyway, uh, the Shafi is strong in Egypt, also parts of Iran, and uh, the Shafis are those who are uh, basically kind of more close to Shiite Islam in respecting the, uh, the family and household of prophets. Uh, the other group are called Maliki and uh, Maliki ibn Anas was the, the founder of it, uh, based on, in, in Mecca, and it's also dominant in North Africa. Uh, so it's another school, uh, more kind of restricted. Uh, there is uh, the Hanbali one, Ahmed ibn Hanbal was the, uh, uh, the one who established this school. And it is the most liberal and conservative of Hanbalis. And then Esther says on the Hadith, Esther says on, on the literal understanding of, you know, the Hadiths and texts. So mostly in Saudi Arabia, and the group who were kind of based themselves on the Hanbali school were Salafis in Saudi Arabia, but they understand uh, Islamic law uh, as the major, major and main aspect of religion, and they they were they, or they are following uh, uh, this Hanbali school, and it's, they're kind of restricted in a way that uh, the only school that they sort of accept is their own school. They don't give room to the others and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, if you are uh, belonging to a mazhab, uh, usually mean that, as I mentioned, where you live, as we, we did see the, you know, uh, the uh, divisions um, previously. And uh, so also <clears throat> you, pick one and stick with one. You're not, uh, I mean, usually, I mean, historically it has been like this, but maybe today in contemporary world, Sunnis may, you know, may follow different mazhabs in different, uh, you know, juristic uh, problems. Um, but <coughs> uh, generally differences between the mazhabs uh, uh, are, Minors, uh, you know, I said, because uh, the point is that how to do this prayer. I mean, the prayer is co common among them, but how to do that, it's a minor problem, but they do, uh, you know, have differences. Uh, um, so uh, fundamentally, they differ on use of usul al fiqh. As I mentioned, usul al fiqh is the um, approach uh, uh, or principles of understanding Islamic uh, law and Islamic uh, literature and jurisprudence and law. And then they do have different approaches in that understanding, makes uh, different uh, interpretations. <laughs> so probably one question here is that 
Uh, so who is the observance of Islamic law? I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, so caliphs were kind of uh, rulers that people you know uh, coming back to them and asking them questions for judgment. Now uh, there were kind of a uh, uh, notion uh, that uh, a ruler and the king is kind of legitimate uh, <clears throat> by the by the divine or divinely uh, legitimate person to you know uh, to protect Islamic law and uh, Islamic scholars sometimes they were uh, uh, kind of protecting the rulers saying that they are uh, protectors of God's law and therefore we are in fact um, uh, supporting them and it was practiced. It was practiced between both Sunni and Shia Islams. Um, so, one of the major major uh, uh, ideas that we hear about Islam is that the problems of Islamic law today, uh, and this become controversial, this becomes, uh, you know, more in the news rooms, uh, more in the discussions, in the papers. So, and then the, the, the very uh, term and uh, word that is used mainly basically is the sh Sharia law. Uh, now we understand that there are many different interpretation of Islamic law. And there's no one single way of understanding Islamic law. What God or what Quran talks about, uh, you know, uh, a thief, uh, so how he wants uh, such and such things to be practiced in the society. There are different ways of understanding it. But the point is that uh, <clears throat> how Quran is described itself as a book of law is or is the Quran a book in which basically the Islamic law is written or not? It has been discussed. Um, and mainly, I mean, I know I mentioned that the uh, uh, out of uh, 6,000 or maybe 500 verses about uh, describing the law, and they are not systematically, uh, they are here and there. And um, so one, one question is that whether, whether this book wants to call itself as a book of law. And what if there is no an authority such as prophet in the uh, uh, Sunni Islam, and specifically, in the uh, there is no prophet and imam basically in the Shia community, and who is authoritative? Who is uh, uh, who has the authority to you know preserve and to practice the law to punish people or not and judge among them? And that's a kind of difficult question. Many people try to discuss this. Many people try to say that, okay, laws are due to change based on the change in human social behaviors. One, two, some other, like Allama uh, Tabal Tabari in the Shia Islam, he claims that laws are basically not, um, especially the laws that we do have among the human, in human community, like the laws and rules among, between people and governor, between people and people. So you basically create a law based on the need of people in order to establish a certain relation. Imagine, nowadays we are living in a world 
that there's, I mean, we can imagine that there's no slavery. So do we have, are we going to write the rules on the slavery? No, we do, we do not. But there was a time that humanity was living with the idea that there must be a slavery and they did practice a slavery sometimes based on law. I mean, they had their own laws. And so uh, people uh, like Thomas Bai, they mentioned that laws are not primary aspect of religion. They are becoming a secondary uh, aspect based on the needs of society and based, imagine we didn't have computers a hundred years ago and we didn't have an issue which was called hacking. And then we didn't have rules on those things. So now we do have, and if we are living in, a, for instance, religious society, we wanted to understand what is the Islamic law about the hacking? What is the Islamic law about the copyright? So what should we do? These are the things that are changeable. You, these are the things that, okay, there are basic ideas in the Quran and then the faqih or jurist is going to understand what to do with the new situation, one, what to do in different places. Does the ruling of Islam is similar in the capital, in the cosmopolitan and in, in, in a small village? or there are differences, there are many, many discussions. What is the Islamic ruling about the woman? About the very different, I mean, these are discussed hugely. And uh, nowadays, especially reformists and among the Muslim, they're discussing the law and how it should be practiced if it should in a society. And who is uh, authoritative to understand it? And is there any, like uh, someone can punish people with, based on not doing or doing a certain law? So now we do have uh, the idea that, that there's a, uh, I guess, uh, in the, in, even in the most, in the countries that they call themselves Islamic countries. We do have, yes, we do have those laws, but based on the Islamic law, but we do have also the civil law as well. We do have the local practice and local law as well. And uh, now some try to adapt the Sharia law to modern conditions, sometimes they were, able to do that for someone not. The problem with them was that they didn't understand or they didn't pay attention to, uh, to one aspect of Islamic law that it could be changed based on the time and place. And uh, so they were rigidly tried to copy and paste it without understanding the time and the space. So, <clears throat> with, with the modern time, with the modern ideology, uh, there were certain problems and issues that happened among the Muslims as well. And uh, uh, what happened? Usually we see that uh, the authority that uh, Muslim muftis or Muslim, uh, you know, clergies had in the traditional society, usually they do not have the same uh, authority in the modern society because of the, you know, the rulings and the civil laws and the changes in communication and whatever. And if in the traditional society, a jurist was the main character 
and source of information among the Muslims and followers. Nowadays, people have a thousand and other source of information for them. Now, so the, 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 there's a decline of authority of ulama and mazhabs, especially in the Sunni Islam, in, in part in Shia, but not as strong as in the Sunni. Um, and then uh, one thing happened uh, in the Islamic uh, societies, basically, it's a funda fundamentalism and individual interpretations. You know, with the decline of the traditional way of understanding religion, more people, if there were some people who tried to understand religion gradually, I mean, individually among themselves, and it led or led them to fundamentalism. And if they were kind of involved in politi politics, it led them to Islamism, which is kind of, uh, making a political uh, or a, po a political Islam, uh, which was the, the um, it's a, which was kind of trying to say that Muslim communities need to return to their original form and need to, uh, you know, sort of fight back with the modernity. So instead of, uh, uh, of understanding how to act and react and uh, with the new notions, they were kind of rejecting new notions. And then one, one of the uh, aspects of this way of understanding or what happened in the modern time is the Salafism. That is kind of um, basically trying, trying to say that uh, I am uh, the version of Islam which was, which tries to look back to the origin and avoid the, the modern understanding of Islam. And uh, so basically kind of uh, rejecting other interpretations and ways of understanding Islam. Nowadays also we see that in, in this, uh, in Saudi Arabia, Salafism is also politically faced with uh, new uh, reforms and changes, and uh, there might be, uh, you know, another um, fate for Salafism uh, under the certain current political, uh, you know, uh, political uh, leadership in that country. So pretty much uh, when we discuss about the um, Quranic, <coughs> uh, uh, the law in the Islam, we do uh, certainly understand that the text has kind of flexibility. Uh, there are ways to interpret and reinterpret text. And uh, so that was a cause um, to that was a cause to the appearance of different uh, schools and madhams in Islam. And uh, uh, basically, the following Islam's um, uh, following Islamic rules uh, was uh, traditionally free for, for people to choose among the masabs or madrasas or schools that they had. And then uh, just uh, uh, Islamic laws uh, was practiced uh, in, uh, in, 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 in uh, among the judges or among the jurists of Islam and people were following that rule traditionally and uh, you know, were ruled, it was ruled among, uh, upon the people and practiced uh, actually among them. <clears throat> um, so now the, the, we can understand that in both Sunni and Shia Islam, the Quran occupies the most uh, prominent position among sources of law in Islam, 
and the juristic tradition dealing with the principles of law describes it as the first source of law. So uh, the first source of law is the Quran. However, it is unsystematic, but uh, the point is that it uh, gives the notions and the way of understanding uh, and kind of works as a source uh, uh, from which uh, other laws are understood. Last and not the least point about the Islamic law is that if you understand and accept Quran as a source of Islamic law, then you say that, okay, Quran is not subject to change. But in fact, um, the Islamic tradition is uh, saying that Quran is the source of law. Quran is a, a divine text, but at the same time, the divine text of Quran is flexible. Flexible in reading and understanding it. And that's why in Islamic tradition, uh, you see that, um, uh, you see that uh, different school appear. And uh, there is a still way of understanding, way of interpretation, and way, way of, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, describing Islamic law based on the time and the space. This, uh, the issue of time in the space is one of the things that usually in, uh, in the discussion of FIP as mostly in the modern time, especially was discussed. And uh, it's uh, one of the basic uh, uh, elements of putting Islamic law into practice needs to understand uh, the, uh, the time and the space and how to do this or how not to do that. So uh, in another way, uh, Law is not like a principle of uh, religion. Uh, you know, a certain law is not like the idea of Tawhid. A certain law could be understood in different way. Why Tawhid is just, you can understand it as one God. Uh, but still, uh, even there you do have interpretations, but in, in the Islamic law, you do have much more space to understand and interpret it. Thank you very much.